First up, we have Senate File 998, uh, Senator Zhang, um, Student Loan Advocate Establishment. Uh, please come to the front, introduce yourself, and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, I have in front of me is uh, Senate File 998, a uh, product of a uh, long uh, amount of work by uh, those uh, like Senator Murphy, who started this uh, work a long uh, a while ago, and uh, I'm trying to build off the work of Senator uh, Duckworth, uh, who carried it uh, last session. And uh, this bill is an important step in Minnesota, as we are we are on the uh, heels on the passage of the Minnesota Students' uh, bill, bill of Rights back in 2021. Uh, this bill is um, as much as an educational opportunity for students contemplating higher education as much as it is for prevention of a student loan uh, debt crisis. Uh, essentially by giving the Department of Commerce the ability to protect borrowers and from having their rights, uh, protecting their rights from being violated uh, by a lender or if uh, they have questions, or if they are trying to petition, uh, seeking some sort of resolution on an issue with their student loan. And we have a fiscal note attached, um, and it just shows the actual needs uh, that will help make this helpful for the Department of Commerce. And right now, Minnesota ranks fifth among student loan debt, and we're talking about uh, in the nation for student debt and the average student debt is well over $30,000 per borrower. Uh, this bill would allow better information for new and existing borrowers for talking about you know, the student loans and preparing uh, to repay that debt. And also with me, I have a couple of testifiers. Thank you both for coming up. Uh, please introduce yourselves for the record and proceed with your testimony. Okay. Um, uh, hello, uh, I'm Dr. Hedy Dembruski, and so um, I wanted to uh, thank uh, you, Chair Fata, and committee members for hearing my testimony in favor of a student loan advocate. Again, my name is Dr. Hattie Dembreski, and I'm a biology faculty member at Normandale Community College uh, in Bloomington, Minnesota. I've taught biology at Normandale for 16 years. Um, my students are wonderful, I love it. Um, for many of them though, navigating college and loans is a significant challenge. Um, I'm gonna come back to them, but first I'm going to tell you my story. Um, I earned a bachelor's degree and a PhD in order to be become a teacher in higher education. Like most Minnesota families, my family did not have the means to pay for college out of pocket, so student loans were a necessity for me to achieve my academic goals. As a young student, I honestly just signed on the dotted line um, for my financial aid packages. Um, I did understand I would have to pay them back. Uh, but I was broke and was going to be in school a long time because I knew I was going to go for a PhD. And so um, I did what I was told was necessary to uh, pursue my education. I did graduate with my PhD. I found a postdoc with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I started paying back my loans. Um, as someone working in public service, I remember hearing about the public service loan forgiveness program from a friend who uh, told me about it because she sat on hold with her loan officer for over an hour and never talked to anyone while trying to get information about the program. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years later, I heard about it from a colleague who tried to figure out uh, how to apply but got nowhere. At around the same time, I also heard from people who were given bad advice, had refinanced their loans to wrong loan types, and then uh, did, not end did not end up qualifying for uh, forgiveness. I looked into this option myself and dismissed it as impossible to navigate and rife with abuses from um, loan services. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. So over the course of 15 years of repaying my loans, I simply paid them without any hope that I might be able to access loan forgiveness. I was never provided any information about this program from my employer, the colleges I attended, or the loan servicer that I paid every month. 
Uh, you may know that there have been some flexibilities in place for public workers in the past year to address huge issues in the public service loan forgiveness program. In the last year, I was able to get help and support from my union to answer my questions, check my documents, they gave me advice, and they held my hand over the nine months of the application process. I'm a capable person, and I could not have gotten through this experience for applying for loan forgiveness without these advocates to help me navigate the maze of this. But most Minnesotans do not have an advocate to help them with loan repayment, avoiding default, dealing with deceptive leading practices, or determining if they have loan forgiveness options. I encourage you to support a student loan advocate for my students and all Minnesota students. Even at Normandale and all of our two-year college and technical institutions, tuition is not cheap. Student loans are a necessity for a lot of our students, our biologists, nurses, electrical line workers, heavy equipment mechanics, for all of them, it's a necessity. Most of them leave school with debt. Absent a state or national commitment to free higher education, student loans are simply a fact of life for most students. I am on the committee for the biology scholarship at, uh, that we give at Normandale. Um, for those uh, who qualify for financial, uh, excuse me, for those who qualify for financial aid, um, they can uh, uh, become applicants for this uh, scholarship. Last year, we had 300 applicants for uh, two $1,000 scholarships. Uh, there's incredible need for financial help. I recognize myself a bit in these students and that a lot of them are not from families with means and are first generation college students. Many of the students who attend our two-year colleges work multiple jobs and attend school. And on top of that, they have to learn how to navigate college itself in addition to being able to, to determine the short and long-term implications of a financial aid package. They need someone on their side who, can, uh, tr who they can trust to give them the correct information about their loans and to help them navigate problems with their leaders, lenders excuse me, and servicers. This legislation will give students that support. Please support this important legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Do thank you, Dr. Dombrowski. Um, Ms. Splice, would you, or Splice, I'm sorry, would you Splice. like to? Splice. Mm -hmm. Thank yep, you. you Please it. proceed. Uh, thank you, committee, for spending the time to hear us out. Uh, my name is Sarah Splice, and I live in North Minneapolis. I'm a high school English teacher at Jefferson High School, so just down the road. Um, in Bloomington, and I'm also here to speak on behalf of this much needed legislation to protect student loan borrowers. Um, I'm here because my students, and I'm referring to all of my students in the same way that she also spoke on the fact that community college is no longer, uh, gone are the days where you can just pay out of pocket for community college. All students need loans in order to be able to further their education if that's a choice that they make. Um, and this, they deserve a fair system that would allow that to happen. Uh, as a borrower, my loans were sold into eight different pieces with different student loan servicers. When I attempted to consolidate my loans and enroll in an affordable income-based repayment plan, I needed guidance to fill out the applications and following very contradictory rules. I called my loan servicers again and again. Instead of help, I got inexperienced employees who could not answer my questions. Uh, when I did receive answers, they were always different. <clears throat> After I filled out an initial application on my repayment plan, weeks passed before they responded to that application, and then it was to tell me that it was filled out wrong. I had to start over. They didn't just let me fix the errors. They said, you need to start over. <laughs> Even after I restarted the application, my loan servicer made me correct the application six separate times, each time with a new mistake that had not been flagged before. A process that should have taken just a few weeks took me six months, uh, which also forced me to put my loans into forbearance, and my interest rates went up and up and up and up. Um, every year since, I've had to reapply for that repayment plan, um, and the process usually takes just as long. Please keep in mind that this is me putting forth the effort to pay off my loans to an institution who should want my money, but, find, but I find that their practices are so inefficient and probably um, abusive to the point where I'm incapable of doing so. All I wanted is someone who could advocate for me. 
uh, to help me better understand the process, to hold my loan servicer accountable for their mistakes. The mistakes of my loan servicer did not cost them anything, but cost me thousands of dollars that I now have to pay back. As of today, my loan has been transferred again. I have no idea who my loan servicer is now, and I am just freaking out a little bit <laughs> about the process that I'm about to have to go through again to figure out how to pay off my loans, to ensure that I'm enrolled in the public service loan forgiveness program appropriately, and to also have them uh, process my repayment plan appropriately. Um, and also the fact that if they don't, I miss a year potentially on my loans getting forgiven, and that kicks me out of the system. Um, I'm one borrower, that's it, right? But this happens to thousands and thousands of people, and I, every time I look at my students and they talk about having to take out loans, for as best as we can, we try and make sure that they have the education leaving high school, but it's not enough. Um, and we need someone to help us uphold those responsibilities of those learn, loan servicers um, because they fail to uphold their own responsibilities. So it's time for these borrowers' rights to be protected. With a dedicated advocate, with the power of the state behind her who can cut red tape, help Minnesotans get, Minnesotans get answers, and hold loan servicers accountable for honesty and accuracy. Please support this legislation. It is time. I have testified multiple times for this advocate. I'm surprised that I'm here still. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I believe we might have one more uh, testifier, uh, Mr. Runnigan. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Fate and uh, Ranking Minority Member Duckworth and members of the committee. My name is John Runnigan. I am president of Lena Men, a nonprofit organization that represents 100,000 community and technical college students across Minnesota. I am here in support of Senate File 998 because student loan borrowers need an advocate for them. As a first generation college student myself, paying for college is one of the most challenging parts of attending. I already struggled exponentially with completing the FAFSA due to not having support or anybody to walk through the process for me. After completing the FAFSA, I was told I was receiving no, res no support due to my stepdad's land and equipment being used against me on my financial aid. I was faced with the decision drop out and fail to pursue my dream of becoming a teacher and getting out of generational poverty that has struck my family for years, or taking on student loans my first year of college. I decided to take out student loans in order to continue my education. Unfortunately, I fell into a very similar situation that I had with the FAFSA program. I didn't know what I was signing up for. I didn't know the difference between subsidized and unsubsidized loans. I didn't have anybody in my life to help me. I didn't know who I needed to pay and how payments work, I didn't know who controls my loan. All I know is that I took out thousands of dollars and was left to figure out when it came time to pay. This legislation will begin to help students navigate this process by building a student loan education course. Such a tool will help, would have helped me better understand what I was doing before I signed that dotted line. In addition, there are way too many shady student loan companies out there, and this legislation makes it clear who I can go to to help in resolving a dispute. Students need an advocate, and this legislation will provide that for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Runnigan. Are there any questions uh, for our testifiers or the author on this bill? Any last comments, uh, Senator Zhang? Um, no, it's a good bill, and I think uh, this will help go one step closer to helping students of the state to navigate uh, the complex uh, student loan process and the repayment process. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Sorry. No, it's Senator <laughs> Umu Verbin. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, voice support for our students. I've been through this process, as have many of my friends. It is very frustrating, confusing, difficult. I mean, young people having to go through this with like, no... Um, experience a lot of us too um, who are like first generation kids right and we don't have parents who have gone through this process or other folks that we can lean on for help so um, I just want to voice my support and say that I think it's it's great that you were setting up a process to give our students some support through a really difficult process 
Thank you. Uh, Senator Zhang, it, looks, it sounds like we're referring or re-referring your bill to Commerce Committee. Um, yes. Senator Umu Verbitten, would you like to move Senator Zhang's bill? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'll move. Uh, Senate file 998 um, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. Thank you. Senator Umu Verbein moves that Senate file 998 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The bill is recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Fate, you have Senate File 1709 in front of us. Uh, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, Chair Umu Verbitten and committee members. Uh, I'm proud to be here today to present Senate File 1709, which makes some needed changes uh, to the University of Minnesota region selection process. Um, I know we all had a long evening sitting through the important process on Tuesday night. And uh, my hope is that that experience will set up uh, a good conversation for today. Uh, this is first and, foremost, first and foremost a bill brought to us by the University of Minnesota students. They are the Board of Regents most important stakeholders and when they tell us that the process isn't working, it is incumbent upon us to listen. I know that those of us in this body have had our share of frustration within the university's governance process as well. It's clear that the way the board has been operating recently has undermined public trust in our land-grant university system and raised concerns about the lack of transparency and accountability to university community members. Today, I hope we can start a conversation about how to rebuild that trust, and I'm committed to working with all members here today to take your ideas and to work on this bill together. Before I get into the details of this bill, I do note that these changes would not affect this year's regent selection process. We will not be moving this bill forward until this year's appointments are, are made by a joint session of the legislature and, though, and these proposed changes would only go into effect for the 2025 region selection process. First, this bill actual, actually changes the composition of the board itself to create more accountability and representation for the, uni, for the core university uh, constituencies. Currently, the board is composed of eight congressional district seats and four at-large seats. One of those at-large seats is reserved for someone who is a student at the time of their appointment, but the other three are unreserved. I am proposing that we change those three unreserved at-large seats. The bill would reserve one such seat for someone who is a tenured faculty member at the time of their appointment, one for someone who represents a university employee organization, and one for an enrolled member of one of Minnesota's federally recognized tribes. Students, faculty, and staff are all core constituencies of the board. It is fundamentally important that each of us, that each of these groups is represented by someone on the board who shares their experiences at the institution and can speak to their needs. As a land-grant university on treaty land, it is also important that a board member represent the perspectives of Minnesota's tribes whose land was taken from them to establish our state's research university. Much like the existing student seat, the, legislator, the legislature still uh, is still free to choose the qualified candidate that they think is best, and this bill does not infringe on our ability to do so. Next, the bill contains a technical cleanup on uh, how seats are assigned between congressional and at large. We create a mechanism for these seats to be reassigned in the event that the state gains or loses a congressional seat. 
We nearly lost a congressional seat two years ago, and we discovered that the current law does not provide for a process to alter board composition when the number of districts change. The bill also establishes a two-term a two two limit for regents. This is to ensure that we keep some healthy turnover on the board and don't have well-connected candidates institutionalizing themselves on, uh, in this role. We also propose changing the composition of the Region Advisory Council or Region Candidate Advisory Council or RCAC. This is the state board charged with recruiting candidates and recommending them to our joint committee. Currently, the board is composed of 12 members appointed by the Senate and 12 appointed by the House, with one appointee from each chamber required to be a student. As wise, and, as wise, as, as, wise as we all are, I think it's fair to say that the legislature and the, uh, and the legislator alone can appoint a full board that represents the views and experiences of all stakeholders. To that end, the bill would change the appointing authorities for RCAC. The House and Senate would continue to appoint members on the committee. Of the 25 members uh, this language establishes, five would be appointed by the House, five appointed by the Senate, and we intentionally made the legislative appointee compose, uh, compose less than half of the total board to try to take politics out of the process. Ultimately, the legislature still remains its full authority over nominations, and it's, and it's, the, it's the prerogative of both chambers to act outside of RCAC's recommendations if we choose to do so. We also have five seats reserved for the five student body presidents of the UMN campuses or their designees. This will ensure that students on each campus have a voice in the recommendation process, which we all believe is crucial. The bill further provides one faculty member from each of the five campuses to be appointed by their respective faculty senates and one appointee from the governor's ethics councils. This bill also changes the rule of the joint committee so that two candidates are nominated to the floor for each seat rather than just one. This gives our, four, our full joint legislature the choice between two candidates in each seat and does not limit it to one candidate we are required to advance under current rules. Finally, this bill prohibits the practice of floor nominations for regent candidates. Truthfully, members, I've, got, I've gone back and forth uh, about whether or not to include this provision, but it's in the bill today for one key reason. It is my firm belief that every single candidate for the board should be vetted, tested, and voted on by the members of this committee and our counterparts in the other body. We are the committee that conducts oversight and, appro and appropriates public funds to the U. The idea that a candidate might skip the line with a floor nomination and be voted on without members of this committee having the opportunity to screen them is, fundamental, is fundamentally at odds with what I believe is the, is the duty of our committee. At this point, I'll turn over to our testifiers to share their thoughts on the bill, and I want to express my appreciation to the students for bringing this bill to us. We are, uh, we'll be laying this bill over today to continue the work on this, and I sincerely look forward to working with all of you to strengthen this proposal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Fate. And our first testifier is Sia Sakranande. If you could come forward, uh, state your name for the record, and then you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Mover Baton and members of the committee. My name is Sia Sakranande, and I'm the state coordinator for the undergraduate student government at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which serves over 30,000 undergraduates who make up our student body. I'm here today to speak in support of Senate File 1709 because of how this would uplift the voices of the most important stakeholders that are often forgotten, the students of the University of Minnesota. I'd like to thank Chair Fate for carrying Senate File 1709 and for listening to student voices and working to support them. Many students at the U have little to no interaction at all with the Board of Regents throughout their time on campus as students until a contentious vote or egregious remarks are made during their meetings. I found myself in that category too until I came into this role and started to work on making sure good regents who care, who care and prioritize our students are chosen. The problem with the current lack of interaction between students and the board is that when decisions are being made, there's no avenue for us to ask questions or have our voices heard. It is in the regent selection process that students can and should have their voices heard the most, which is not happening. 
By working to include student voices on the Regent Ca Candidate Advisory Council, students are guaranteed a seat at the table when making initial recommendations of candidates to the legislature. They're able to work with other stakeholders like faculty and members of various councils that represent students on our campus to ensure that whoever is representing us understands us. Working to get those stakeholders, along with our frontline workers and indigenous populations, seated on the board is another way to ensure that student identities are properly represented in our highest governing body. In my various meeting with legislators this session, you all have shared with me frustrations and concerns about how student needs should be addressed, the lack of transparency and accountability on the board currently, and the lack of interaction that you all have with the board. I often respond with, if you all at the legislature are feeling this way, then how do you think us students feel? This is why we need to work together to make sure that we are choosing the best candidates possible, and that starts with reforming the process. This bill is the right step forward to ensure that the Board of Regents are more representative of major campus stakeholders that get left behind when major decisions are made. Through this partnership of students and legislators, we are able to ensure the selection of quality candidates to serve students. We appreciate the hard work that this committee has put in the Regent selection process, but it is time to get students involved as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, Sakanande. Our next testifier is Sarah Davis. Please come forward, state your name for the record, and then you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Uma Verbaten and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Davis. I'm the current Vice Chair of the Student Representatives to the Board of Regents and the Ranking Representative from the Twin Cities campus. I'm here today to urge your support for Senate File 1709. I will be the first to tell you that even with the existence of the student representatives and our ability to make comments during board meetings, this is not enough. I began my job as a student representative in August. It is painful how quickly it became obvious to me that what we are doing right now isn't working. I don't speak nearly as much as I wish to, maybe once or twice in committee. I'm sure there are regions who would disagree with me and tell you that I talk all the time. But the fact is, we don't have nearly enough people or time to cover everything we need to say and that the regions need to hear. As student representatives, we author reports every year that frequently average around 60 pages on all of the things that matter to students. But we only present to the Board of Regents for 30 minutes, roughly once a year. And I'm deeply aware that my time to speak when the regents meet every couple of months has to count. Whether I'm commenting during a committee, presenting, or running into a regent in the hall or in the line to get lunch. And I know that a misstep could result in people disregarding student opinions for years to come. It's devastating as a student to hear that the people in charge made up their mind well before you got there. The experiences I've just shared with you clearly demonstrate what every student, staff, and faculty member at the University of Minnesota will tell you, and what I'm sure anyone in this building already knows. As important as our voices are, the place runs on votes. This is where this bill is most important. Instead of telling regents to hear more from students or to have more administrators come before the board, this bill gives those underrepresented voices institutional power. I would love it if just hearing the stakeholders of our university community could create change, but it doesn't. My own position is proof of that. So I encourage a yes vote because vesting power in these community members in the bill before you is what will actually encourage change to begin. Higher education is in a crisis. You can't sit through five minutes of a regents meeting without seeing it. The numbers don't add up. Minnesota invests a large amount of money in pre-K through 12 education with aims to better our students to succeed in the workforce and more often than not, than not that is through continued education in college. Without good institutions of higher education, there is nowhere in Minnesota for those brilliant students to go and you lose the return on your investment. That's why good regents make a difference. They set the policies that make the university a good place to go. And when students have an overwhelming number of choices about where to go to college, the university has to provide an environment that fosters excellence in every way that it can. That's not just academics, 
but professional connections and student services. It includes a great workplace for staff that provide these crucial, crucial services and faculty that can continue their work and raise the bar in their field. Once again, I urge you to throw your support behind this bill. The continued survival of the University of Minnesota depends on its ability to attract and retain all kinds of students, staff, and faculty. We can't do that unless the people making the decisions on the Board of Regents or throughout the selection process do not represent those voices. Students like myself are not here because we don't understand that these things are hard. We are here because we know they won't get easier unless everyone is represented. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Um, before we move to the next testifiers, members, do you have any questions for uh, Ms. Davis or Ms. Sacranade? Okay, we'll keep moving along. Um, our next testifier is on Zoom. Dylan Young, you may um, unmute and then please uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. My name is Dylan Young. I represent the students at the University of Minnesota Morris. I currently serve as the student body president, the elected representative of our 1,000 current students. I would like to say Palamaelo, thank you to Chair Fate and the members of the committee for allowing me the chance to speak today. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Morris Campus Student Association in support of Senate File 1709. Last fall, Regent Steve Swigum asked if it was possible that the Morris campus had become too diverse from a marketing perspective. From conversations with students, staff, and faculty at UMM, I noticed two conversations our campus began having in the aftermath of Swigum's controversy. The first conversation I noticed was people became interested in how the board operates and how a region is selected or not selected to serve their term. The second thing I noticed was that people started to understand the importance of having strong leadership on the Board of Regents, because we learned that week what happens when there's bad leadership. Let me start with the first thing. The Board of Regents, as it turns out, is not an easy institution to understand for the average student. I found out it's not even easy to understand if you're a faculty or staff member. The consensus at UMN Morris seems to be that the current process to elect a regent is confusing, nonsensical, and undemocratic. People don't really understand why the House and Senate gets to choose all 25 people appointed onto the RCAC. They think it should be made up by the main stakeholders of the regents, you know, the students, workers, and faculty of the University of Minnesota. People also don't really understand the point of the process. If representatives at the joint convention can just ignore the joint committee's recommendation and go with anybody they want. People have asked me, what's the point then? And to tell you the truth, I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, I think the region selection process is broken. Right now, there's no mechanism that ensures the main stakeholders of the region selection process are represented in the first stage. There's also nothing stopping the joint convention from outright disregarding the recommendation from the joint committee. When it comes to transparency and representation, the current process leaves a lot to be desired. These modifications proposed in this legislation would fix that. It would decrease the Senate and House's role in the RCAC appointments and guarantee representation from the people that are actually impacted by the Board of Regents. These reforms seem like a no-brainer, at least in my opinion. Now, let me return to the second thing I've noticed from a campus. I've noticed that people are starting to realize how the Board of Regents impact their everyday lives on campus. In October, Harry Colbert reported um, to the Minnesota Post that BIPOC students felt unsafe, unwanted, and isolated on the UMN Morris campus after Swigum's comment. Speaking about my own experience, after my written response to Swigum went viral, I was catapulted to a level of scrutiny that I was not used to, and I got to witness firsthand that Regent Swigum's comment stoked a fire in some people. 
Let me read some of the racist comments and messages directed towards me after Swiggum's comments. Maybe instead of writing letters, you could shut up, use that money your tribes are siphoning, and stick to your studies. Assimilation was our strength. Diversity is a weakness. These students at UM and Morris should be less worried about Swiggum and more worried about their safety. The reason I'm sharing that with you today is to underscore the importance of leadership on the Board of Regents. The Regents set the tone for our students and for everyone at the university. They have the ability to empower, inspire, and strengthen the University of Minnesota. They also have the ability to do a lot of damage. If it was up for me, up to me, the student body president of UM and Morris, Steve Swiggum and candidates who do not stand with students wouldn't have even made it through the RCAC process. But it's not up to me. It's up to the partisans and the legislator. And instead of choosing a real leader, they chose to give a former Republican House Speaker something to do during retirement. And because of that decision, myself and BIPOC students at UM and Morris have felt more unsafe, unwanted, and isolated than we have in a long time. I could talk about this all day, but these are some of the reasons that myself and my peers urge this committee to consider supporting this legislation. Alama ALO, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. I just want to um, say I'm sorry that you had to experience those um, racist comments and responses from folks and um, think the comments that were uh, made by Regent Swiggum were absolutely inappropriate, just uh, speaking for myself. Um, but we will bring forward our next uh, testifier, uh, Nam Nguyen. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Uh, please come forward. You can uh, state your name and begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, and thank you, Madam Chair and the honorable members of the committee. My name is Nam Nguyen, and I'm the Duluth Student Body President. And I'm here speaking on behalf of all the students, the student body presidents, the largest stakeholders at the university. Compromise of over 68,000 students spread over five campuses. And over 24,000 staff and faculty, the University of Minnesota is the largest educational institution in Minnesota. The university has made a name for itself across five unique and distinct campuses and attracts many students from Minnesota, across the nation, and across the globe. The largest impact of the university is its students, with over 63% of graduates returning to the Minnesotan workforce. It is safe to say that the students have the largest stake in the university. And as students progress through their college careers, they are constantly affected by the decisions of leadership and the influences of their fellow peers. As the governing board for the university, the Board of Regents determines the vision of our university. They ensure the fulfillment of its mission of education, research, and out outreach for the benefit of the Minnesota, of the people of Minnesota. Every decision that the board makes affects the outcomes of students and their education. With students being the largest stakeholders of the university, we, the student body presidents, believe that its leadership should be compromised with those who best fit to serve the diverse student body and push efforts to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion to serve the students of now and the students of the future. With the recommendation of adding a representative from the Indian Affairs Council, the Minnesota Council of Latino Affairs, the Council of Minnesotans of African Heritage, the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans, and the Council on Disability to the Region Candidate Advisory Council, we believe that this will be a beneficial addition to further the efforts of increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion at the university. Adding a diverse set of thoughts to the, to the advisory council that represents the students and picks the regions who benefit them and make the decisions that happen at, at the university. With the addition of American Indian Regent and a representative from the Indian Affairs Councils, we believe that this is a good stepping stone to amplify the voices of American Indians and acknowledge the land that the university sits on. With each new academic year, there are new voices, there are new priorities. There is also a new diverse set of views at each campus. The needs and the wants of each and every student will change yearly and even daily. New governance committees, new student leadership, new leadership. Out with the old, in with the new. The main job of student governance groups at each campus is to collect, interpret, communicate, and amplify the needs, wants, ideas, and, current, and concerns of students. Our jobs as student body presidents will not stop until the voices of all students are heard. Our organizations will work tirelessly to effectively advocate for the current students as well as future ones. 
level outside of our organization's hardworking student representative to the border regions. Increasing student representation on this level will enhance the culture and the mission of the University of Minnesota, increasing the reputation of the university, attracting more students to Minnesota, and exporting more graduates to the Minnesotan workforce. To allow all five student body presidents to sit on the Regent Canada Advisory Council is a good starting point, but not the only one, for the advocacy of the University of Minnesota student body, our constituents. We, the student body presidents, representing over 68,000 students that the University of Minnesota educates, this bill provides many important and fundamental changes, and on my behalf as the Duluth student body president, as well as Dylan Young, the Morris student body president, support this bill and emphasize the importance of section five subsection C. We ask that you, that you guys pass the bill, and if there are any opposing thoughts, just please consider the importance of section five subsection C to allow student body presidents and, other, and others to sit on this advisory council to better represent our students, our peers, our constituents, and to the encompass the diverse set of thoughts and ideas that our students possess, to advocate for current ones as well as future education. Thank you, Nam Nguyen. Uh, our next testifier is on Zoom, Riley Tuft. Uh, whenever you're ready, you can unmute, state your name, um, and then begin your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Riley Tuft. I'm the chair of the student representatives to the Board of Regents and a member of the UMD Student Association. This is my second year serving as a representative to the Board of Regents. Within this position, my top priority is to advocate for students. I'm here today to encourage you to support this bill, which is a first step in ensuring the student voice is heard. I would like to first share with you my experience being a representative from a greater Minnesota campus. One of my first experiences meeting and talking with the Regents was when four Regents came to UMD Myself and the other student representatives from our student association were immediately taken aback by the region's lack of knowledge of our campus and our students. I have since learned that this is a shared experience among all of the greater Minnesota campuses. I'm sure you can imagine the frustration of our student association because these are the top decision makers for our university, and yet they seem to know very little about UMD. Since then, our student association has made it a goal of ours to fight for the equity of all five of the University of Minnesota system campuses. As for my experience as a representative to the Board of Regents, myself and other representatives to the board have had the opportunity to voice the student opinion by contributing to the Board of Regents committee meetings. Although we have this opportunity and are able to make comments and suggestions during these meetings, it is simply not enough. Oftentimes it feels as if our comments are dismissed or ignored simply because we're students. In watching the board meetings, you can see this is evident. Myself and other representatives to the regents have made statements and sent letters to the regents regarding specific situations that directly impact students. And while I would love to give you all the numerous examples of what we have said and done and the responses and lack of action we received in return, my time here is limited today. But I will say that a majority of the time we are met with a board that had already made up their minds and chose not to take our concerns into consideration. This is a troubling pattern that needs to be addressed immediately. The current system is not working for students. Student voices are not being heard or represented, which is why change is necessary. Passing this bill would enable the main stakeholders of our university, the students, to take an active voice in choosing who makes decisions about our education and overall student experience. Students are more than willing to be involved in these processes that affect them. Our student body presidents will be able to accurately represent the needs of the greater student body. Enabling students to have a voice in selecting their regents is not only necessary, but essential to the success of our university. If student voices are considered during the regent selection process, I believe that our future regents will be far more representative of our students. And I also believe that having student contributions during this process is the first step to ensuring the regents as a whole are receptive to the thoughts and opinions of students at the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna pause here again and see members if you have any questions for our most recent testifiers. All right. Um, we will move to our next two testifiers. Um, if you wanna come forward, Darren Rocha and Ed Reynoso. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Thanks, Murphy. Madam Chair, I, you know, as the testifiers are coming forward, it occurred to me um, that we're hearing from students 
and some who are engaging with the Board of Regents and not always feeling heard. Um, and so I thought, it, as I listened to your question, Madam Chair, I thought it would be right to make sure that the students who are here testifying today understand that we are hearing you and listening. Um, and while we might not be engaging in a lot of questions um, in the moment, uh, I don't want you to feel or walk away from this experience like what I heard the testimony from the, the leader who was talking about her experience with the Board of Regents. So I just, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Um, just on that topic, too, of students, hopefully you've seen in your packet, you know, we've heard from a number of our student body presidents, but we also have letters of support from um, the Morris and Rochester Student Associations in, in your packets. Um, with that, Darren Rocha, you um, can state your name for the record and then begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Darren Rocha. I am currently the uh, University of Minnesota Regent representing the third congressional district. Um, and uh, this is um, becoming a habit. I appreciate the opportunity to provide input again after having an unusual familiarity with uh, the university and specifically the regents and regent selection process over several uh, decades now. Um, you know, I've got my prepared remarks, uh, but I, I find myself reacting to so much of what uh, the students are saying. I mean, the, the students are right. Um, and, you know, I have, I've wanted to see more student input uh, when it actually matters. Um, I, I believe that I've uh, been a, a strong advocate uh, for the, the student position, particularly as it relates to affordability um, and access. Um, I also note that, you know, that uh, I, I couldn't agree more that the, the stakeholders uh, are students. Um, for the average Minnesotan, I think they see students as being the primary stakeholders of an institution like the University of Minnesota. Within the institution, it's, uh, the, the, there's a focus on a tripartite mission of, of, of teaching, research, and, and outreach. So there are many uh, constituencies of the university, but I, I really think that over time, my experience is that students have, have been shut out of a lot of processes that I think they should be much more involved in. Now, uh, to be clear, each time I've become involved with the Board of Regents, it's been pretty random. Um, as a working class uh, family um, uh, product, first generation college student, I never aspired to put in thousands of hours on a public board uh, without compensation, uh, and a board that is both critical to our state and at times incredibly frustrating to all of us. And when I was asked as a student to be a student representative uh, elected by the students, and you've seen some of the quality folks that occupy those positions now today, um, I was flattered. Um, I, I, I didn't know what the regents were uh, or what they did at the time, um, as others have talked about, but I was flattered to be asked to advocate for student issues. And my service as a student as a non-voting advocate happened to coincide with the student regent seat coming open. Um, and quite frankly, getting elected to the Board of Regents is oftentimes just sort of happenstance uh, for a number of reasons. But going through the very first candidate, Region Candidate Advisory Council process, because it was, the first year was 1989, and that was the year I was elected to the student uh, regent position, RCAC interviewed about a dozen candidates per seat and nominated a full slate of four candidates for each of the seats. I was elected with a strong majority uh, by the, the joint session of the legislature that at the time was about two-thirds uh, DFL. And I believe I was a strong advocate for affordability and for improving the student experience during that six-year term. When I returned to the board in 2015, the RCAC process became captive, I felt, and, and I still feel, by a small number of university insiders, which um, had at that point been limiting the number of people that the legislature could even consider to be elected to the Board of Regents. And that was never the intent of the uh, creation of the board nor the creation of the Region Candidate Advisory Council. Those of you that recall um, uh, former uh, State Representative Lynn Carlson, um, he was one of the authors of the original RCAC bill. He'll confirm that the intent was to identify and present a full slate for the legislature to consider. He only added the language at least two but no more than because people said, well, what happens if four people don't apply for a specific position? Are you, you know, how are we going to fill this? He said, okay, well, at least two uh, but no more than four. And then since then, the, the committee, the, the council has, has narrowed it more and more uh, saying that they think that there should be fewer candidates and ultimately I think restricting who the legislature and students for that matter can advocate for for election to the, to the Board of Regents. Um, 
I have testified at the legislature before about the issues with RCAC process and the propensity for insider control leading to what we've seen where you have unprecedented salaries, unaffordable tuition, a lack of transparency at the University of Minnesota, and these issues are not problems in our surrounding states. And it shouldn't really be a surprise. The process that was created, the current process, was proposed and continues to be supported almost exclusively by a group of insiders uh, from the, uh, with the Alumni Association, and they, have their, they receive their budget from the university's budget. And when those same folks have for years been recommending the names for appointment to the RCAC process, in very busy leadership at the, uh, at the legislature is usually happy just to get that task out of the way. It shouldn't be any surprise that the very limited number of region candidates forwarded for legislative consideration have generally been operating very, you know, uh, in, in close uh, concert, uh, as, as some people would describe as rubber stamps for the administration without a lot of input from students and people outside of that, you know, uh, that group. This was never the intent when governance of the university was placed in 12 citizens from across the state. And I would, I would note that despite the fact that I have criticism of an RCAC process at all, at least one of the things that I do like about Senator Fate's proposal is it does take that, it, it broadens the number of people that are in participating. I think it's going to be harder for people to capture a process with, with changes of this nature. I'll now move to the other components of this. When I look at section one, this has very specific requirements for faculty, regent, and an employee uh, from an employee organization. Now, I've uh, been watching this stuff for many years. Universities around the country have different rules, but the majority don't permit what is considered by most to be an inherent conflict when a trustee is employed by the institution they oversee. There are upsides and there are risks, uh, and those are the decisions that you have to make. I don't find myself intrinsically against it one way or the other, uh, but I will just say that there are some uh, possible unintended issues. Uh, so, for instance, if people change jobs, if a region elected under such a requirement makes a change in employment, it could create vacancies or undue pressure on that person from a career standpoint. It would also require major changes to the university's conflict of interest rules, as these rules currently don't permit regents to be employed by the university, with one exception. The student regent may have student employment while they're in that seat. Um, Regent Rosha, yes. just to ask you to wrap up in the next minute so we can get to questions. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I'll go on to section three is titled when we talk about the term limits. Now term limits are usually intended um, not to affect our own selections but to keep someone else from electing who they want but we don't necessarily want. I, I should disclose that I've never been an advocate for term limits for political office including for state legislators. While I agree that some folks get entrenched and become very difficult to replace as incumbents, the unintended costs exceed the intended benefits in my view, especially considering those voting uh, always have the ability to limit the service of a person by not electing them. This has really hasn't been an, an issue for the regions for a century. About 100 years or so, people used to serve on for decades. But in the last 50 years, only Dr. Patricia Simmons has been elected to a full third term, and that was when an RCAC candidate withdrew. I don't think anyone has really identified the problem in this, at this point. In fact, right now, with this next election, there will not be a single regent in their second term. Every regent will be in their first term after this next election. There are also unintended negative effects. First, making regents slam ducks for the six years upon their second election does shift the dynamic away from the people's board to the administration. It can also be a problem if all the senior regents are in the second term and all up for election at the same time. And I'll, this is my most important point, Madam Chair, and then I'll, I'll cut the rest of my testimony. Um, I think it also prevents some very strong and potential candidates for well-informed service from being able to again fully serve. I'm specifically referring to those who've held the student regent position. With this rule, any of the people with the insight and experience as a student regent could not serve two terms later in life after gaining life experience. I'm hopeful I will not be the last to bring this perspective. So who would they be since I served as the student at large regent? Jessica Phillips, Maureen Ramirez, Lakeisha Ransom, Venora Hung, who was not the student regent, but she was a student when elected, Abdul Amari and now Mike Kenyanya have all served, will have served six year terms as regents and if any of them after or during their impressive careers decide to come back to serve, they'd be lame ducks from the moment they're elected, which has an impact on this board. This is not good policy and will discourage their interest and limit the legislature's ability to tap into their talent and experience. Um, I'll leave it with that, Madam Chair. I've got many other thoughts on this topic, um, but I think that the, the Constitution leaving this decision with you the more Byzantine you make the process, the fewer candidates you're going to have. The people I served with the first time that had been elected directly by the, the Senate committee and the legislature included a former senator and governor, former AFL-CIO leader, business leaders, 
they don't want to go through this process. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult process that they've seen as being controlled by a small group of people, and I think that that's had an impact on this board. So taking away the ability to, for the legislature to nominate and elect on the floor also cuts against certain uh, uh, democratic purposes. I would also point out from a representation Thank standpoint. You. Regent Rosha, like 20 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. When I leave the board, I believe it may be the first time in the university's history that somebody with past military experience will not be on the board. And, uh, and, and so there are a lot of different groups for whom this is a very important institution. And so uh, I hope that you take this policy discussion very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ed Reynoso, you may come forward and s state your name for the record. Whenever you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Edward Reynoso. I am the Director of Political and Legislative Affairs for Teamsters Local 320. We represent roughly 1,500 members at the University of Minnesota throughout all five of the, the campuses. Now, let me just say that we are in solid support of this legislation, this proposed legislation. Uh, there's no question that uh, there needs to be a revamping. Uh, one of the things I was recently appointed to was the RCAC. And I, I like uh, the fact that, that uh, some of the biggest questions that, that came out of that RCAC process was accountability. Um, the other thing was uh, making sure that there's more interaction, more, more public engagement. Uh, I can tell you throughout uh, the last few years that the public engagement is just almost absent. So, you know, there, there's some substantial changes that, that need to come with the Board of Regents at the University of Minnesota, and I, I think uh, they're very going to they're going to be very well welcomed. Um, if there was anything anything that would improve this, and just uh, I appreciate Senator Fate bringing this forward. If there was anything that would make it just a little shinier, would be it would be to add a labor seat to the RCAC. I'd like to think or, or believe that my input as a labor leader as a labor representative in the RCAC made a difference. And I believe that we've been able to put forward and recommend some very strong candidates uh, for, for students, for labor, and all of the stakeholders and faculty at the University of Minnesota. But again, I mean, one of the, the, one of the large, the, the biggest things that I think we, we um, instilled in, in the process was that these new regents that are gonna be selected are, are gonna have better, gonna have to have better accountability and that comes with interaction and public engagement with the stakeholders. And that's students, that's faculty, that's workers. So, and the communities at that, because let's face it, I, I believe that the University of Minnesota could be better, better uh, neighbors to our communities that they belong to. So uh, with that, again, we're happy to take any questions if there are any, but uh, we are in solid support of this proposed legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynoso. Um, members, what questions, comments do you have? Senator Rarick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, uh, just a quick clarification question for uh, mm -hmm. Senator Fate. Um, in your opening remarks, you made comment that uh, one of the at-large seats would be for a member of one of the uh, tribes. And as I read, I do not believe that is what it says. So can we get clarification? I believe it um, when we look at subdivision two is just that one of the seats um, would be somebody of a, of a tribe because when we look at the effective date, we only discuss the implement, implementation of the two seats in the at-large, one faculty and one uh, employee. So can we get clarification on how that would be done? Yeah, Thank you, Senator Rarick. I was, if you want to answer, Senator Fate, you can. Council is also happy to weigh in. I'll pass out the further council. Go ahead. Um, Madam Chair, Member, Senator Rarick, you're correct. Thank you. Thank Senator you. Rarick. Okay. Thank you. I, I did want that clarification um, as, as I read it, that that's the way it is to be. Um, so a, a couple... I think I'll just do a couple of comments. Um, you know, I, as somebody who uh, has gotten very involved in uh, the regent selection in the last uh, 
three years, so the last two cycles. Um, I 100% agree that reform needs to happen. Um, I'm not a fan of the RCAC process. Um, it has become very, very political. Um, the thing is, um, the joint higher ed hearing is political and the floor elections are also political. So thoughts on this. Um, first one, just, you know, I, I do 100% I agree on the five student representatives. They are the largest stakeholder group. Um, they will bring the perspectives of their campuses. Um, I struggle with having the other 10 uh, positions designated the way they are and then a fewer other people. We, we also need a vast array of people from the community a part of the process. The university does a lot in agriculture. We don't identify an ag person in this. We do a lot in the health um, area. We do not identify somebody from that area in this. You know, we could go down the line and we could put 100 people on the RCAC process to make sure we cover every entity that is involved with the U. I, I don't think that's where we want to go. Um, so I hope we can have some discussions around that, ab about that membership. Um, I, I do think it needs to be a little bit more balanced um, so that all of Minnesota ha has a voice because um, we hear it over and over, um, you know, the U is autonomous, yet they are coming to the legislature uh, for money, so the taxpayers need to have representation on that pro in that process as well. Um, and I do struggle, um, there are a number of things in Senator Fate, I will have um, other communications with you, um, saying that there would be no nominations from the floor um, is one I really, really struggle with. Um, like I said, the, the process to get there is political, um, and I believe the students would agree that probably one of the best voices they have on the Board of Regents right now was someone who was nominated from the floor who made it through the RCAC process but was not recommended to the floor by the Joint Higher Ed Committee, and he was nominated from the floor. So I don't want to limit that um, because um, it is a very small group of legislators in the higher ed committee who send those recommendations on and may not reflect the, the true feeling of the legislature and may not actually forward the best candidate, which is what I think happened in that situation as well. So. Um, a lot of other things, but I'll let other members uh, comment. Um, I appreciate uh, the discussion because I agree 100% um, we need to change the process. Um, this is a start. I'm not sure it's the complete answer, but thank you. Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate your comments, uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, we're trying our best to take the politics out of this. Um, and this bill will be laid over. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, your valuable advice and your input um, because it's going to take that also um, to make this a, a good bill so, or a, a more better bill. So thank you so much. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Just some questions and comments regarding the bill. Uh, some of them will echo what Senator Rarick had to say, so I'll be uh, brief as it pertains to that. Uh, lines 1.15 through 1.18 when it talks about one member of the Board of Regents must be a person who at the time of election to the board is a tenured faculty member of the university and then below that must uh, another one that must represent a university employee or organization. Uh, I think you know as we're having conversations about how we might be able to tweak or improve the bill or potential modifications rather than saying must we could just say it's recommended that uh, and that would give the legislature the freedom and flexibility I think that it has uh, vested to it via the Constitution to utilize its discretion uh, regarding this process rather than saying must. Uh, oftentimes there is merit to an organization having a degree of separation between a governing board and self-interest. Oftentimes that's used to avoid the potential of conflicts of interest. And I think specific to uh, the language of the bill there, uh, making it must versus a compromise might be a recommendation. 
uh, something that should be considered moving forward. As we look at page two, uh, specifically lines 2.17 and 2.18, it's talking about what would happen if you know, there's a change to congressional districts. I think it's very smart to look at what those potential scenarios are and be prepared for them as it pertains to our state statute. So my question is, it says, if due to congressional uh, apport apportionment, the state loses a congressional district, the regent seat designated for that district shall represent the state at large. My question is, is the idea that that would then at some point uh, sunset and then in future elections, we would get back on track uh, given that change, and then a follow-up would be, it goes on to say, if the state gains a congressional district, the next vacant at-large seat must be assigned to the new district. Is that, again, until uh, an election can take place for the new district? We might not have these answers right now, maybe filter them away as, as this gets laid over to figure out what we would do in those scenarios and, and spell it out in the law so that we know what we would do. Uh, I also thought it was interesting that we were going to give the Board of Regents term limits, but we ourselves don't have term limits. Uh, that's an interesting thing to consider. Um, moving on to the Regent uh, Candidate Advisory Council. Again, <clears throat> uh, the rub I have with some aspects of the bill is, is we're limiting the role of the legislature. Uh, and I think that, not to get too philosophical with you, but when we look at the way our democracy is structured, Every branch has a very specific role, whether it be the legislature, the House, the Senate, whether it be the executive, whether it be uh, the judicial branch. And any time that we potentially diminish or lessen the role of any one of those respective branches, it gives me cause for pause. And I see the potential of that happening in this bill. Anytime the legislature is going to cede or give away some of what it's been responsible for historically and what the Constitution calls for, I think it's something we need to give a whole lot of consideration to before enacting. So that's why I kind of have uh, some issues in regard to that. Um, we've got a couple more questions I'll skip over for now, maybe visit with you offline about. But getting to the last page, uh, again, I would echo the sentiments of Senator Rarick. Um, first off, the joint, I'm looking at lines 5.2 and 5.3. The joint committee uh, must recommend two candidates uh, and only, uh, why limit it to just two? What if the joint committee wants to do more than that? Uh, and I think in some instances that, that maybe has happened. Um, and then last but not least, no additional nominations may be submitted. I'm looking at line 5.9, meaning what traditionally has been the case during that joint session of the House and Senate when we're voting on regent candidates is that we can have folks brought up at that time as well. Uh, that would be a pretty significant change to a historical precedent and procedure that I think has at times shown a lot of merit. Uh, and so before we completely get rid of that, uh, I would recommend that we give that a whole lot of thought uh, so that we don't avoid that. Uh, not to go backward, but I'm going to do it anyway. When we're looking at some of the additional folks that would have to be on the, uh, the advisory council, mm -hmm. I did have the same thought. Um, I wrote down even before uh, uh, Mr. Rocher brought it up, I said, how about a veteran, right? There are other groups out there that we could have uh, that have very valuable perspectives. I'm a product of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities Army ROTC program. I spent way too many hours in the armory on campus and running around in the morning waking people up as we're doing PT. Uh, that's a very valuable perspective to have be a part of this process. And who's to say that some of those folks aren't, aren't veterans? I get that. Last but not least, I just want to give uh, some brief commentary and then I'll wrap it up and turn it over. So I, I very much appreciate the input and engagement from our students and testifiers, many of whom we've heard from several times and have even sat down with me in my office. It's our job to be accessible. Nobody's arguing that and I think every Democrat Republican up here has done a very great job of being accessible and open to and hearing from the students uh, of, our, of our public ins higher education institutions and I commend all of you for that. And that's something that we should sustain moving forward and we should see more of. Uh, regarding stakeholder feedback, the legislature should take the, that input under advisement, not abdicate or diminish its constitutional duty. Uh, the bill lessens the significant role of the legislature as it's currently written, thereby removing the much broader and vast voices of Minnesotans represented by their respective elected officials and whom the university exists to serve. This issue can be resolved through the time-honored process already in place. There's been great bipartisan collaboration. Mr. Chair, you've been a part of that, uh, to that effect already. Let's continue to do that work together. We can add student voices while also honoring the historic role the legislature is called to play per our state constitution. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Uh, Senator Fate, do you have a response? And I know the council can also weigh in on some of those questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll let council go first and then I'll respond. Okay. That's right. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Duckworth, um, your analysis of the um, changes if we lose a congressional seat are very valid. Um, that would have to be something that would need to um, be addressed. Um, I assume that if we did lose a congressional district, we'd add another at-large seat, so there would be five instead of four, but that would need to be incorporated into the bill as a whole. Senator Fate. Yeah, thank you, Council. And thank you, Senator Duckworth, for your concerns. I know you laid out a lot from representation, um, which we also care about. Um, I think you and Senator Rarick also brought the issue of uh, 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 not allowing floor nominations in this process. And um, I, ju I just wanted to stress the importance of um, having the, 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 this committee and the joint body ha have the ability to uh, vet and go through each and every one of the um, individual candidates. Um, and to not go around that process, um, what we don't want to see is candidates that had uh, not been vetted, not been spoken to, just showing up on the floor and then winning. So that was the idea before that. But you do raise a fair point, and I, and I hope to work with you to flesh out some of the details uh, around all of your concerns on this. So thank you. Members, other questions, comments? Oh, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you, Senator Fate, for, for bringing this to us. And I also wanted to take a moment to thank our pal, Senator Duckworth and Senator Rarick, because a lot of the stuff you say I 100% agree with. Yep. Um, and it's definitely a profound need to reform the process that does this. It surprises me every year that anyone would ever want to. <laughs> like, honestly, um, given how opaque the process is, even for those of us who are doing it, sometimes we don't know what's going on. And to, to go through this incredibly rigorous, strenuous, stressful process, uh, that is fundamentally unclear uh, uh, and sometimes I bet feels unfair. Uh, I think those are things that we should strive against. Um, whatever final result this bill takes, I'm glad that we're starting in that direction. I do want to, however, stand up for faculty because that's my job. I kind of kind of do it. Um, and that's that um, we could, and I think uh, Senator Duckworth makes a valid point to say that there is an elasticity to the notion of representation where we could say, well, everybody needs their own representation given their own space. But I would argue that we need to be able to make specific distinctions in these places relative to people's positions within the context of the institution as a whole. Uh, there is a traditional and profound antagonism between faculty and administration. Um, a faculty member on the Board of Regents could potentially alleviate some of that. Uh, universities are also places of deep, deep silos where uh, you, know, you could be in one hallway and have no idea who's in the hallway next to you. Uh, that division, those, those sort of silo spaces, are much worse when it comes to administrations and faculty. Uh, so to me, it makes sense to think about this in the context of faculty, student, administration, because those are the basic food groups. Not that everything is also really important. It is. Uh, but uh, those, I think, are some of the basic food groups. And having faculty representation in this space is key. Uh, there are a few people on a college campus who know as much as what's going on in students' lives sometimes than faculty members. Uh, who know what's happening in the classroom. So I think that they, uh, I think that the board would be improved by that voice as well. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Senator Rare. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And so uh, just real quickly to that point, it was one thing that I did forget to mention. And, you know, so it is something that we're going to have to ad address kind of on the whole. Um, we had a, a candidate in, I believe it was the second congressional district who is a professor and at the very first stage of the RCAC, the fact uh, it was brought up by members of the RCAC that um, I believed he was qualified and should have been moved on. They expressed a conflict of interest because of his position and refused to move him on through the process. So um, that that is, you know, by saying that they have to be on, that is a perception that absolutely then has to be uh, removed um, if we're going to go there. So, I, and I think that's a part of a bigger discussion because um, there's, and it's, I think sometimes that conflict of interest gets thrown out um, because it's somebody you don't like, and so then we throw that out there. Um, 
as an excuse rather than an actual belief that it's a conflict of interest. So um, I I do agree that I I personally agree that um, somebody who is an employee there could serve on the Board of Regents without it being a conflict of interest. Um, I'm not sure we should designate uh, two spots for employees, but I would think potentially one spot for either of those uh, positions. So thank you. Um, I'll go to you, Senator Putnam, and then I know Ms. Uh, Sakranane wants to respond as well. Oh, sure. I just wanted to respond to my pal, uh, Senator Rarick, for just for a second and say that although uh, clearly in the past couple months the board has had a little bit more comfort with conflict of interest than we would like to see, <laughs> um, uh, I would make a distinction when it comes to faculty members. Uh, because to, uh, it, logically, and I, I think your point is well taken and that we need to have greater precision in what conflict of interest would mean in this context. But from my point of view, a faculty member has no greater conflict of interest than a student does. They're both people who are deeply, intimately affected by the decisions that are made by people on the board. Therefore, you could argue there's a conflict of interest, but it would be a poor argument. And I wish I'd been there when that happened because I would have taken it down. Um, but uh, I do take your point that there needs to be greater precision on the notion of conflict of interest in that case. Ms. Sacredande. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Putnam and Rarick, for bringing up the topic of conflict of interest. Um, I watched that interview as well, and um, during the RCAC process, I got to review the board's policies, and there is a policy in there that if there is a conflict of interest, the member can step away from taking a vote. So if it is a faculty member voting on a faculty issue, the faculty member can step away from that vote. Um, and I agree with you guys that, that this needs to be further addressed of like, what is a conflict of interest? But um, there is a policy currently in the Board of Regents that, that you can step away from a vote if it is a specific conflict of interest to you. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Regent Rocha, you can come forward. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, it, the, there, but there is a specific policy that says that a Regent may not have university employment. So the question came up, I was asked this question, I said, well, it appears that based on the policy at the university, the legislature can elect whoever the legislature chooses to elect. You could elect a, a, a faculty member. Um, I've got kids, I'm used to that spot. <laughs> um, but so the question would have been whether that person could have lost their position once they were elected, if they would have then lost their university employment, and that was the big danger. If the legislature were to declare that a, an employee, a faculty member or other employee should be permitted to, I, I believe that the university would be receptive. Of course, I don't win that many votes, but I would certainly mm. support that uh, myself. But you, you know, you can elect whoever you want. It's that it's that policy of the university that says you cannot have university employment that has prevented, I think, other f folks like faculty from running. But 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 once you're there, you certainly have the ability to step away from issues that would directly affect you. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you, Regent Rocha. I was just speaking with counsel. I was po pointing out um, what you both had to say. Are there other questions, comments? Okay, well, thank you for bringing forward the bill, Senator Fate. And this is being laid over. Um, would you um, like to move that Senate File 1709 be laid over for possible inclusion, Senator yes, Fate? Sure, I'd like to lay, um, make the motion. Thank you, Senator Fate. Um, the bill's laid over. And I'm up next, so I'm going to get the gavel back to you. Thank you. 
Next, we have Senate File 1215, Senator Umu Verbeten. Um, I understand you have the A1 Authors Amendment. Would you like to tell us about your amendment and make a motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, just bringing this forward. So we had uh, some blank appropriations in the uh, first version of the bill, and uh, the A1 amendment has some updated information after the fiscal note. So I'd like to move the A1 amendment. Senator Umu Verbein moves the A1 amendment to be adopted. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion is adopted. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Umu Verbein, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this bill um, provides funding to place free menstrual products in students' bathrooms in two and four year public colleges. Nearly 25% of menstruating students have struggled to afford menstrual products in the last year. 10% uh, of those struggle with menstrual product costs every month. 86% have started their period in public without access to menstrual products that they need to function throughout the day. Without access to products in their places of learning and work, people have to leave class or work to take care of their basic menstrual needs. Period poverty, defined as a lack of access to menstrual products, um, education and hygiene facilities, is linked to depression and anxiety, and it does cause students to miss class. Those who experience period poverty are also more likely than their peers to show um, these signs of moderate to severe depression. We've heard a lot from our students in this committee, and um, we'll be able to hear directly from students on this bill, but you know, students consistently tell us that they cannot focus on school or achieve their goals um, when their basic needs are not being met. And menstruation is just a basic bodily function. Um, it's a basic need that needs to be met with these free and accessible products. And we know um, that when students don't have their basic needs met, it, it just makes learning really difficult. Um, forgetting or not having access to menstrual products can lead to fear, um, to shame, and it can make students feel that they don't belong. Um, it interferes with their learning and activities, and it just doesn't have a place in our um, educational institutions. These menstrual products should be readily available and free, just like toilet paper um, and paper towels and restrooms that, you know, help us address our natural bodily functions. Um, and uh, these products, I also don't think, should be coming out of universities like DEI budgets um, or out of the pockets of these, you know, women's centers. And I like those are actual examples of what is happening right now on our campuses because we're not um, funding the, the cost of these products. So no one should have to worry about um, you know being able to afford these products in schools. And uh, I also think you know where you go to school shouldn't really determine if you have access to this. So that's what this bill is hoping to address. And um, I look forward to hearing directly from our testifiers. Thank you, Senator Umu Verbein. Uh, I think our first testifier is on Zoom. Um, Ms. Kendra Drager, please uh, introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Chair Pate, Ranking Member Duckworth, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Kendra Drager, and I am a student at Bemidji State University and also a board member of Students United. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Menstrual product access on campus has been a priority for me personally, and Students United has long advocated for students' access to basic needs like menstrual products that are affordable and accessible for all students. Menstrual equity is important to me because it refers to the affordability, accessibility, and safety of, our men of menstrual products. On average, menstrual products will cost a person about $20 a month, about $300 per year, and around $12,000 over their lifetime. A majority of college students have struggled with deciding whether to spend their money on food or menstrual products, and most choose food. 
Students should not have to make the choice of deciding where their next meal should come from or if they can afford to take care of their body's natural processes. Menstrual equity is about making sure that people have the needs, support, and choices to, to decide how they want to take care of their menstrual health. Not only is menstrual equity about affordability and accessibility, but it also is about ending the stigma around menstruation that has prevented not only lawmakers, but also healthcare providers, educators, and individuals from ensuring that menstrual health is a priority. Too many students are struggling with which aspect of their basic needs they should prioritize when they should not have to choose which basic needs is most pressing at all. If this bill had been law at the start of my college experience, I would have had much more consistent peace of mind that my peers and I would have the menstrual products we needed on the campuses where we live, learn, and work. These products are basic needs for over half of our student body and the lack of inclusion of our basic needs in our facilities tells us that we need to fight for our place on campus in some of the most basic ways. SF-1215 would declare that all students at, pi at public higher education institutions in Minnesota deserve to have the basic, their basic needs met, that menstrual product accessibility is an issue of equity and belonging for our students, and that no students should face barriers to their education and well-being, especially due to something as basic as menstruation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I believe our second testifier is also uh, virtual, uh, Ms. Kaylee Weber. Um, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Chair Fate, Ranking Member Duckworth, and members of the committee, my, my name is Kylie Weber, and I'm a student at Winona State University, as well as the State Chair of Students United. Students United is a nonprofit organization that represents the thousands of students that attend the seven Minnesota State Universities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on Senate File 1215. Students' access to menstrual products varies widely across Minnesota's public colleges and universities. Within the Minnesota State Universities, we have campuses where women's restrooms in most, most buildings have a variety of available menstrual products for free, while another campus only has menstrual products and their women's center, their women center director chooses to purchase out of their own budget. The burden of lack of accessible menstrual products in our public colleges and universities lies most heavily on the students of our low-income students who face what is called period poverty. This inability to afford basic needs like tampons or pads often leads to other struggles around academic success, mental health, and general well-being. We know these problems are real from the stories we've heard from our students. Stories where students have to leave class to run to their apartments or dorm rooms since their university buildings, bathrooms, menstrual products, dispensers are always empty or require a quarter, which few students carry. Stories like my own where resident assistants have to take money out of their programming budgets or use their personal funds to buy menstrual products for their residents, while toilet paper and paper towels are always covered by facilities. Stories like a campus paying for menstrual products through their diversity, equity, and inclusion budget when over half of the student body experiences menstruation and requires these products to be accessible. Based on these stories and many others, Students United and I personally believe that all students deserve easy and free access to menstrual products as a basic need, regardless of the college or university they attend. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify on this bill. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Uh, next we have Darren Roche, no, I'm sorry. We have Sam Galt. I apologize, we have Sam Galt. <laughs> What do you think about this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I gotta do this. I gotta cover it. Excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Fate and members of the committee. Um, my name is Sam Galt, and I'm speaking on behalf of the National Council of Jewish Women Minnesota in my capacity as the communications and engagement manager. I was also a college philosophy instructor for nine years, which informs my testimony here. Um, NCJW Minnesota has been advocating for menstrual equity for years now. We've heard from many educators and students about the importance of this bill and of fulfilling these needs for students, both in terms of education outcomes and creating a respectful and welcoming environment. Um, you've already heard several statistics from the State of the Period 2021 study. I would add, um, this study found that 38% of students said they were unable to do their best work in school 
due to a lack of access to period products. And additionally, 65% said they did not want to be in school when they were on their periods. And this means that 82% would say, if there's free toilet paper in school bathrooms, there should be free pads and tampons as well. These are all hygiene products. Now, there might be many objections to this bill. One would be that it is too expensive. We would counter that this is a very minimal investment to achieve a massive benefit, and it presents a rare opportunity in that sense. Another might be a hesitation to impose an additional mandate on Minnesota universities and colleges. We would counter that as Minnesota state legislators, it is your job to ensure that our students have what they need in our schools. There might be objections to providing these products to transgender students. To that, we would say that not everyone who menstruates identifies as a man, and the need is the same in any case. And lastly, there have been concerns with the K-12 bill about vandalism and theft, if these products are freely available in bathrooms. Um, however, in schools that have piloted programs, giving out free menstrual products, this has not been an issue. And here we're talking in K-12 environments. So there's no reason to think that it would become an issue in a college setting. Um, therefore, I urge you to take seriously what these students have said today, and I thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, finally, we have Olivia Osei Tutu. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Um, my name is Olivia Osei Tutu, and I'm a student at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, and I also have the honor of serving as the Chief External Affairs Officer in our UMD Student Association, which is our student government on campus. Um, but I'm here to speak to you today about the importance of free menstrual products on college campuses. A few years ago at UMD, we actually started um, to provide free menstrual products um, in 15 of our bathrooms on campus as a pilot program. And it's been going very well, and um, facilities management has indicated that they want to um, require new, these dispensers in all new women's and um, gender neutral bathrooms. Um, when we have new buildings. Um, and they would like to include the cost for providing menstrual products in their operating costs, along with toilet paper, paper towels, and soap, all that kind of stuff. Um, even though we have a great program in place, there are other locations on campus that um, students would like to have these dispensers in. Uh, and students in the dorms will leave um, pads or tampons in the dorm bathrooms for others to use in case they need them. Uh, and like they'll buy, and buying extra products is not a cheap thing to do when you're a student, um, but having like free products uh, for others to use is so important that students will spend an extra five to $10 just to support others. If you factor in them having to buy their own products on top of providing for others, students could easily have to pay an extra 10 to $20 um, or more each month just to do this on their own. Um, the fact that students still do this, even though like cost is, you know, it's not cheap, but it's not like terribly expensive, but still, um, it just goes to show the importance um, and the value that students have for having free menstrual products on campus. Um, menstrual products get used just like everything else in the bathroom, like we've been saying, um, but there are only 15 dispensers in all the bathrooms on campus. And that means if a student was in a need of a menstrual product in a bathroom where there wasn't a dispenser, they would probably have to use something like toilet paper until they're able to like locate um, somebody who has extra or a dispenser that's filled on campus. Um, and there's already a stigma around menstruation, so providing these dispensers and menstrual products um, in college bathrooms can help reduce that stigma. If we offer toilet paper for free, we should offer menstrual products for free for students. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we'll now proceed with the questions portion, and, he, and we have uh, Vice Chair Putnam with the first question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Mavridin, for, thanks for bringing this up. This is a really important, compelling issue, and I am particularly uh, persuaded by your analogy to toilet paper. Uh, you know, one of the things I am curious about when we talk about how expensive this is, is wondering how much we spend on toilet paper, and if we would even ask that question if that came up. But maybe it would be helpful actually to have a perspective from the system as, as well. So uh, maybe if we could have someone from Min State come forward and say how you, you feel about this potential bill. Mr. Oman, if, if you would for a second. Thank 
Chair Fateh, members of the committee, um, Senator, it's probably the first time that um, ever somebody from Minnesota State would like to yield to a University of Minnesota Regent. <laughs> <laughs> um, in all seriousness, um, Minnesota State's official position is to um, appreciate the leadership of um, Students United in bringing this forward. As um, Senator said, our work in this area is episodic at best. Um, campuses will use different funds to try to address this and this will give us a systematic approach to um, this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oman. Senator Putnam. Good. Thank you. Any follow-up questions from our members? Any closing comments, Senator Umu Verbein? Last chance, Regent Rosha. <laughs> <laughs> Regent Rosha. <laughs> With uh, th thank you, uh, Senator. With with a wife and two daughters, uh, I can tell you that um, this is this is why it's good to get out of the house once in a while and see issues and discussions because I'm I'm ignorant. I would have thought that this is something that's already provided. The idea that someone close to me or any member of the of our university community would find themselves even unexpectedly facing. Uh, um, a cycle issue and not have access, it, it really is remarkable. And, and the point of, you know, if you provide toilet paper for people's bodily functions, this seems like a pretty straightforward issue. So I would need to, uh, to follow up and first, you know, determine what we are doing and, and how it's being done. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, my one concern is uh, you, you, if, if the expectation is perfection, that, that might be a challenge because it's a gigantic place, and so we would have to continuously improve our processes. But this seems like a, a pretty easy. I mean, you know, we we put in we put in new football turf every you know couple of years. I think we can provide for our students that, that that run into these issues so that they can concentrate on their education. So, speaking as an individual member of the board, um, but I, I think it makes remarkable sense, and I'd be um, you know devastated if this isn't something we provide, so thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, Regent Rosha. Um, any final words also, Senator Mover Bain? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to give Regent Rosha some time back. I know, like, to cut you off earlier. Uh, I, uh, I just want to thank our students, really, for bringing forward this issue. They've been very active on the um, E through 12 front as well. And, you know, I, I think back to my time in college and, like, these products are expensive. And I remember, um, you know, leaving home and my mom having a, a pack of, you know, tampons that she was sending me with. And then the panic when you run out of that and trying to figure out how to cover that cost, um, even, you know, moving off campus. I remember my roommates and I like panicking on how we were going to be able to avoid, uh, afford toilet paper as we um, talk about um, here. So uh, again, just many thanks to our students for um, their continued advocacy. And um, I look forward to uh, moving forward the bill. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, would you like to move your bill as amended? Yes, Mr. Chair. Senator Umu Verbein moves that Senate file 1215 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion. This bill as amended is laid over. Thank you. We are now adjourned.